started. We still might have a couple other people pop in. It's not a big deal. Um, so welcome everybody um, to our composer chat for the Prismatic Congruency series. I'm Beth Rissé, I'm the artistic director and also one of the performers on the series. Um, it's great to have so many of our composers and some of our performers with us today to chat about these pieces. Uh, we'll get to know a little bit about every piece. And if you haven't seen them, they're all on our YouTube page. Uh, if you hear uh, about a specific piece that you're really curious about, you can find them uh, through the Prismatic Congruency series. There's links on each series set to the specific pieces if you're looking for a specific piece. So uh, without further ado, we're going to start by talking to Fivos about his piece, How to Make an Omelette. So uh, can you tell us just a little bit about it? Sure. Thank you for joining uh, the talk. Uh, thank you for inviting, uh, for organizing all this. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I'm, I'm Fivos, Fivos Angelos Kolias. Um, and uh, I'm a Greek born, uh, UK, French educated. I live in Berlin right now. And uh, I'm working um, in general, I'm working um, with uh, algorithms that are performed by human musicians or not, um, which are destined for music performance, either active installations, virtual reality. And, um, and my music background is uh, interactive music. Um, I mean, I'm rooted in instrumental classical studies, but I'm basically uh, working in interactive composition the last years. I have a PhD also from University of Paris 8. Um, and um, about the piece that, um, by the way, I was in Boston in 2009. Um, it's been some time. Um, with, with a, with, uh, there was a piece with Alea 3 Ensemble at the time. Um, so about the piece, as you said, it's uh, how to make an omelette with interactive sound. Uh, so it, it started, it's it, the, the prehistory of it is um, um, an algorithm I ha have been developing for many years that it's kind of quasi intelligent. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of interactive installations with it and performances. I've done some pieces also with, uh, with instruments, a couple of pieces with that. And I wanted to do especially I mean, this piece started when the pandemic also started and was kind of an um, idea how to make something online. Um, and so the idea was how to use this algorithm um, to make a, a series of internet art. So it was made specifically to be online. And that's why it was so st short one minute pieces. Um, and to explore the, the sonic capabilities of this algorithm within a kind of a mundane everyday situation, you know, like a fake um, omelette uh, instructional video. So, and so kind of constructing the banal and the in insignificant with uh, something deeper and complex, if someone can find that in within it. Um, so I recorded and shot the video in um, Honix Studios uh, with Jade Wu, who, who is a professional animator and has good experience in uh, cinematography. Um, and um, and after this three shot video series that you may have experienced, um, I did um, another one with a pizza, uh, which was commissioned by, by Ipse Ensemble. Um, and they asked actually to do a long, long version. So it was like a one hour piece, this one. Um, which was a totally different pace instead of this fast uh, pace. It was more like an a ASMR experience. Um, and then I tried to do something in between with the same piece. Um, instead of having this very long, I tried to condense it. And for uh, Expresiones Contemporáneas of Mexico, the a festival that was also online. And um, to close this um, I, I I have been working towards a live performance of it um, which is still in the baking and because it's I mean it's very much um, um, how to say um, it, it, a lot of editing techniques and that's why it works very well so to do it live it's a bit more difficult I guess 
And I'm planning to expand the idea of working with uh, musicians and instruments in the future. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'll follow that up with just a question on like, what was what was the most difficult part of this for you, <laughs> of, of this particular piece, or even the, the process generally? Um, I think it was I was being exposed myself as a performer. I haven't been doing that for ages. I was always behind um, doing, you know, all, only composing the score or the electronics um, and doing it myself. I mean, I haven't done it for ages. I, I, I was, I was some some ages ago. I was singing and playing the piano, uh, but it's been ages. I haven't done it, and also it's it's a bit more theatrical. Um, so it was, yeah, that was maybe the biggest challenge. And um, in the second part, I was saying before uh, the the long version, which I I just consider them that it's part of the same long piece, long umbrella mm -hmm. umbrella piece. It was how to to uh, keep the pace, and I think that's that's the difficult uh, um, with the attention span and you know being online. I think it's difficult to do anything more than one minute. I guess, yeah. <laughs> Great. So thank you so much, Fivos. Thank um, you. We're going to move on to, oh, I also just want to mention if anybody on the Zoom call happens to have a question at any time, feel free to um, throw it in the chat for any of your fellow composers. Um, all right, uh, we're moving on and we're going to talk to Robert Kendall about his partita. Hi, I'm a Boston-based composer and uh, I actually do a lot with interactive digital music as well. It's sort of a specialty, but this piece is for uh, conventional um, instrumentation, uh, solo viola. And um, of course, a partita is a, a Baroque form. It's um, this piece channels the classical Baroque suite, which normally has four movements, but this was written for Andrew Gonzalez who wanted something short. So I wrote him a jig and then he said, hey, Andrew, how about a, an Alleman to go with your with your jig and it sort of stopped there. But one of these days I would like to uh, finish it and add, add some more movements. But it, uh, uh, so it, it attempts to, to use the conventions of, of the Baroque form, but uh, um, in, a, in an original way. So um, hopefully it doesn't sound uh, like I'm stealing too much from Bach, but of course you always have Bach looking over your shoulder when you're doing this sort of thing, which is extremely intimidating, but inspiring as well. Um, so these these pieces, these these partita movements are all based on dances, stylized dances, and um, both of them, both these movements, the Alamand and the Gig, which are traditionally the first and last movements of a suite, use the, uh, they, they follow the um, conventional dance rhythms to an extent, and they, they also follow the form to some extent. Usually it's a, well, it's almost, well, these movements are always in binary form. So you, you, you play a section and it ends in the dominant key. And then you play, uh, you, then you re usually repeat it with variations. And then you play the second section, which starts in the dominant, and it starts with the same material variation and then ends in the, um, the tonic again. So uh, the Alamon follows that structure pretty much. And the the jig is actually uh, in ternary form. So there's a, a different section stuck in between the two A sections, but it does follow the convention of um, a fugal technique in the opening. So the opening of each a section starts with a theme in in one voice and then con that voice continues on with something else while the theme comes in in a second voice and then in Bach he often um, would do these fugal openings in each section and then he'd turn the theme upside down in the second section so it follows that convention and, and the theme is upside down the second time the second time you hear it so so that's the Baroque part. And then um, the, the, the challenge was, well, one challenge is because I don't play a stringed instrument, it's, it's always hard to tell uh, what is going to be um, 
um, feasibly playable. And uh, especially with the double stops, you know, that's really where the, the challenge is. There's a lot of double stops in this piece. And there's also a section that switches very quickly from pizzicato, plucking with your finger, to um, arco, bowing with the, the bow. And I, I, I thought this was probably impossible to do the switch, but um, Andrew read through the piece and he just calmly started doing the pizzicato plucks with his left hand. So, you know, it, it wasn't really a problem. So you just never know. These, these, um, these performers are incredibly clever at coming up with um, inventive strategies for solving musical problems. So you just never really know what um, what's going to happen when somebody picks up a piece you've written. Yeah, that's why it's yeah, it's great when the performers are able to to uh, find ways to make things happen. It's, all right. Thanks, Robert. You answered all my questions. <laughs> so on that oh. piece. Um, so, uh, next, uh, we're going to have Simon Hutchinson talk about, um, Membrana Timpaniformis, which I performed and I brought into this series, um, because I just loved it so much. I'm a flute player, but I just love playing the piccolo. And, uh, this was like a really awesome piccolo solo. So Simon, why don't you tell us about it? Well, thank, thanks so much for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So the, the pieces for, uh, solo piccolo, this, this piece came about, uh, in the first year of uh, when I was doing my PhD at University of Oregon, they they uh, paired up all of the composers with flautists from uh, uh, Molly Barth's flute studio. Uh, and so this was a, a collaborative composition process with a with a flautist known uh, a flautist called Cassie Lear, who's out of uh, Seattle uh, right now. I think she's still very active. She might even oh, she's either doing a DMA or she's finished her DMA. I, I apologize, Cassie, if, if, if I'm getting this wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, she, she was just excellent. And, you know, I was, I was like, well, you know, what, what kind of things can I do? And, um, she said she loved the Barrio Sequenza, um, which I had to, which is a, you know, killer flute piece, which my piece is nothing like, but, um, to me, you know, I, I was starting my PhD program after spending several years in Japan, uh, studying traditional Japanese music and, uh, sort of searching for this way to bring, you know, my work as a sort of avant-garde, more, more electronic music composer together with these more traditional values uh, of Western music and then all these ideas of Japanese folk music. Um, and so the opening motive is um, a hearing, my hearing of the, the Japanese warbler, the uiguisu. Um, and then from there, it, it sort of is a through composed piece tracking ideas, trying to bring in some extended techniques inspired maybe slightly by bird songs, which I know is not a terribly original idea for flute uh, music. A, a lot of other people have done that before, but um, but sort of, uh, again, also trying to bring in all this, all this ideas of folk music and, and these external pressures of, uh, of, of tonal music too. Neat. Um, so I was curious, um, Oh, what does the title mean? Well, uh, so I, I, uh, the the title is, gosh, oh man, what's the WC piece? I'm blanking. You know, the one that's about syrinx. Thank you, yeah, syrinx. syrinx. I was like, is it so? Yeah. So okay. membrane <laughs> tympaniformis is the is the membrane that birds use to sing. Syrinx is the the whole organ, and so I was like, oh, I, you know, so it's, I'm I'm kind of uh, acknowledging this this connection to to that tradition of uh, of bird song and flute music there too. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So it's embarrassing that I forgot syrinx in, in this, but but you can edit that out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um yeah. Um, and then uh a quick, what was the most challenging part of, of writing this piece for you? <laughs> yeah, um again, it, bringing bringing these ideas together, but I'm also not uh to to sort of come back to uh, uh, what what Robert was saying, I'm I'm not actually a flute. I'm actually a string player originally, and so this was an excellent. The the great thing about being paired up with with people who are working in the studio is we could bring them sketches and say, you know, what's going on with this, and uh, you know, for string players, it's not about worrying about double stops. You know, for for those of us who have experience uh, with strings, we 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 get the double stops, we get all this stuff, but it's it's the breathing. Um, that we really, uh, string players need to, uh, string player composers really need to take some time and learn. And um, this was a great e experience. And, you know, I went on to write a whole bunch more flute music since I've written this piece. 
Um, and, and this piece has really helped me understand what's possible. And of course, anything's possible on the piccolo as long as you have enough time to breathe, right? Yeah, it is. But yeah, I, I, um, a lot of composers, I think, don't want to do piccolo for, for many reasons. It's really high. <laughs> it is. And also, it doesn't, it doesn't have as many um, extended techniques or colors as the flute as the flute can have, but I still love it. <laughs> so um, that makes sense. I mean, you know, I'm actually a doublecist originally. So, oh, did you lose me? Yeah, Am we lost here? you for can a second. Sorry, I'm actually a double bassist originally. So uh, there was something uh, transgressive about writing for piccolo. That was <laughs> the, other, the other range of the orchestra. That was, that was a bit fun. <laughs> cool. All right, thanks, Simon. Thank you. Um, next up is Malika Fitzhugh. Um, and her piece, Laughter, If You Slow It Down, always turns to sobbing. So, uh, hello, thanks for having me. I originally actually wrote this piece for Sopranino Recorder. I actually wrote it while, <laughs> while holding the Sopranino Recorder and um, was just exploring the idea. I, I don't know if where I came across that that quote, somewhere on the internet, maybe in a movie, but it was just an interesting idea that if you are, ha, 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 you know, it really does sort of um, the sound of laughter does turn into sobbing if you, as you, as the quote says, slow it down. So I was exploring, you know, descending thirds a lot in the piece and um, having, exploring the range of a really high instrument and uh, decided that, you know, I was just going to put it in a range that almost any uh, wind instrument could play. Uh, and so I was thrilled when soprano saxophone, it was performed for for this uh, series on soprano saxophone. So. Um, what, uh, I guess, yeah, what was the most challenging thing about writing this piece? Uh, comments from neighbors because I literally was playing it on a Sopranino recorder, which is quite high. It pickle, it's piccolo range. <laughs> so um, there were how long are you going to be doing that? Because I was doing this, beat it up, beat it up, beat it up, you know, trying to figure <laughs> out fingerings and stuff. How long are you going to be doing that? Because that's really annoying. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, that's okay. Good. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. not discouraging at all. <laughs> You're like, oh yeah. So um I was gonna say, um, yeah, how does it how does the um sopranino version like compare to the soprano sax version? Um I would say that it's um a it's an octave higher, so right. it's there's that sort of really high talking about bird song again, <laughs> like all those um shakes on thirds really do sound like trill trills of birds um more even more than this the soprano sax does but i think it has um the the sense of sobbing is actually more present with the soprano sax i i think it uh definitely has more weight to it yeah i thought that that sound the sort of the falling sounds worked well on the soprano sax yeah, because the soprano sax has a sense of having a fundamental, whereas the sopranino recorder is like, we're all overtones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right. Thanks, Mel. Um, next up is Daniel Zlatkin, who also wrote a saxophone piece, Guardian 2. Daniel, can you tell us about your piece? Hi, can you hear me? Excellent. Hi, thank you so much for having me again. And it's really nice to meet all of you. And I just also want to give a shout out to Drew Hostler again for his wonderful performance. So I'm Daniel and I am based in Houston, Texas. I'm a doctoral student at Rice University. I'm also a cellist and I would say as a composer, I'm really interested in the ideas of expressionism as well, uh, and I'm also influenced by psychology, I would say, such as with the ideas of Carl Jung and how those translate into music. So in regards to Guardian 2, um, it's part of a series I've started based on a series of guardians um, 
or various archetypes manifested in different instruments, maybe a bit similar to the Berio sequenzas. Um, and there are only two so far, Guardian two being the second, obviously. Um, the first one is for bass flute and piano, and it depicts something very peaceful and oceanic. And then this one is a bit more, I think, um, playful and mischievous and capricious. And I think I had the ideas of jazz improvisation in the back of my mind mixed with the styles of composers like Hans Werner Hense and Alban Berg and Schoenberg. Um, and I would say a practice um, of writing something for a solo instrument is I really, really love to do this because I really believe that a composer should practice um, really trying to figure out what is idiomatic while not sacrificing virtuosity and being in a constant communication with the performer on that. Um, and I would say the biggest challenge um, for writing this piece is actually what Drew played um, was the net result after several drafts I had worked on with some other players. And the first draft was almost impossible to play. You know, I think as Simon had mentioned very eloquently, um, you know, it's I'm a string player and it, it's hard for us string players to um, get in our head what works well for, um, wind instruments. So I just had to really go back and understand with myself, this does not work. How can I talk to a player? How can a player tell me how to sculpt this material to work better? And so I think Drew ended up playing the fourth draft, uh, which I think is still quite difficult, but Maybe at least somebody, something, somebody would want to pick up off the shelf again. I hope because that that's the story about that piece. Yeah. So our um, just so you know, like um, for this particular one, it's not always the case, but for this series, our um, performers pick their pieces. So, you know, so Drew like specifically chose that piece, um, um, and that's true about like all of the pieces chosen. Um, because especially with solo works, I don't, as an artistic director, I don't like making, <laughs> you're going to spend a lot of time learning something like on your own. I don't want to make my performers do something they don't want to do. Um, but uh, I do have a follow-up question. Um, you mentioned you worked with some specific performers um, and oh, that there is, there is a fine line, both, I can say this as both a performer and a composer, like between there's some things that are just awkward and then there's things that are hard. And there's like a difference between like awkward and hard, <laughs> like, yeah. And there's some sort of line there and you have to find that for each instrument. Um, so did you work with one specific performer or just several different performers? Um, I work with several and um, I wanna give a shout out as well. In addition to Drew, um, a good friend of mine, his name is Jeff Siegfried and he's a phenomenal new music saxophone player and he does some stuff in Europe too for anybody um, based in Europe on here. Um, so he's who I initially wrote the piece for for a concert I had produced in Brooklyn a few years ago and then also another European based saxophonist who small world it is you know be nice to everybody was a camp counselor of mine in high school who went on to become this incredible saxophone player. His name is uh, Don Paul Call, and he's based in Belgium. And he had actually reached out to me to work with me on the piece, as well as uh, commission me to write a saxophone quartet for him as well. Um, so that, that's another great colleague of mine um, who I work on this piece with. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks so much, Daniel. Um, all right. Now we are going to talk with Juliana Hall. Um, and she had three different works on the program. Um, 
to start with in spring, we did the first and last movement of her piece in spring. And also um, the performer, Danielle is here. So after Juliana talks, if you, if you want to jump in, Danielle, feel free, uh, but we'll start by letting Juliana talk about the, the piece. Um, hi, I'm Juliana Hall. And thanks so much for everything. Thanks for these great performances and thanks for having us. And um, my pieces, I'm really always thankful to have a nice performance of pieces. Um, In Spring was written um, a while back. I can't even remember exactly the date, but um, I'm a song composer, an art song composer. And um, I just happened to notice on Facebook that Amy Petrangeli was looking for a solo voice piece. And um, I also love E.E. E. Cummings an awful lot. And I've been writing, um, uh, using his poetry for many, many years. But these were some of his early texts and they were in public domain. And I was thinking about um, how fun they are and how colorful they are. And then I was thinking about Amy and her beautiful voice and all the virtuosic things she can do. You know, talking about thinking about the performer and the composer, uh, just having in mind uh, certain people or certain musicians that you write for. Um, in Spring was written for her. And as I write all my music, it's to express the text. So I, I uh, did the same thing. I, I mean, I, I thought of it exactly the same way I think of every other piece. It's just letting the poet speak. And um, I thought it was really fun because um, with a solo performer, she has freedom to also express herself, her own uh, feelings of the text. And so it gives her some um, room to interpret. And she did that very beautifully in the, her performance. And um, so anyway, um, so that's the story of In Spring. And um, the Auden piece, um, my husband is a cellist. And um, he wrote, I wrote the piece for him, um, The Ballad of Barnaby. And it tells another story. Um, Auden, again, is one of my favorite poets. I've written um, songs using his text before. And um, David, my husband, has played some of my music before. So we, we have a good time kind of collaborating, going back and forth, saying, well, how about a new piece for you? So my um, husband and I worked on that together a little bit, which was really fun because I'm not a string player. But if you live with a string player, it works out pretty well. <laughs> you, know, you can answer any question or um, throw out ideas for m expressing a text uh, this way or that way and so um, and he could try out things and try out the sound and different techniques uh, you know contemporary techniques that I might have used um, but again even in uh, writing the the cello piece um, it um, it's really really uh, I was trying to tell the story about uh, Barnaby the ballad um, it was a funny thing because last uh, fall, I was um, trying to find an instrumental piece to work out, uh, to go with this other um, um, repertoire of mine that, that would fit in a concert, but we um, didn't have a cellist at the time. We had a violist. And I thought, wow, I think Barnaby will work very well on um, viola. So the trick was uh, just transcribing it. But again, I worked with the violist and she was totally wonderful. And I went to her house and she played some things and you know, I rewrote a few things for her. And it was just um, the end spring and uh, the Barnaby was, it was just a lot of fun, both of them really, a lot of fun to write. And again, working with solo, um, players, performers, they have a little bit more freedom than, um, you know, working with other duets or, or um, ensembles. So, you know, it kind of gave room for a lot of nice imagination. 
So that's all I can think of. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, about in spring. I was just curious, um, noticing there was a very specific formatting in E. 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 Cummings um, poetry, and I was just wondering if if you if that had any influence on the way that you said it. Um, I think it does. Always, I look at how the poet looks on the page, and um, I know his his uh, poetry does look different, but. But I think for me, it's just really uh, to express what's uh, what he's saying. But I do kind of, I mean, that does have something to do with it. Not as directly, but, a, you mm -hmm. know, in my mind, a little bit. I it, it doesn't go past my thought of, oh, look at the way he's he has this set out on the page. Yeah. Um, I Danielle's on the call. If uh, do you want to add anything, Danielle? I don't hear from her. Um, I I really enjoyed working on both of these movements. Um, so I, I actually studied voice in undergrad and then uh, composition in grad school specifically just to write vocal works. And as you know, both a singer and a fast composer, I just absolutely love what you did with the text. I mean. I, there was a couple things I just wanted to comment on. Getting to sing Puddle Wonderful, <laughs> the way that line arcs is so fun. <laughs> good, good, good. good. <laughs> and, and then the word mud luscious. <laughs> what a fun word. <laughs> I, I just, yes, I, I love how much you brought out the text in, in these poems. It was, it was really cool. And well, I, I have to tell you that concert I did, um, I, I did uh, both of these movements on a, a small, you know, women in music concert. And I got so many comments on the third movement with the whistling. And I was so nervous that whistling wasn't going to be good, but everybody just loved it. <laughs> oh, good. And I thought your whistling was wonderful, by the way. <laughs> I, and I really thought your performance was very, very beautiful and just right. It did express the text just just the way it was thinking. So thank, thank you. you so much for such a beautiful performance. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I also, Juliana, just wanted to um, talk about um, in the Ballad of Barnaby. So there's like several different characters. And I was wondering if maybe you could give us an example of like um, the music that one character has. Oh, well. Um, I'll think of Barnaby, I guess. He's, um, he's, he's quite a character. He's, you feel sorry for him a little bit because he likes, he's a dancer. He's a tumbler actually. And he's very natural at it. And people kind of make fun of him thinking, oh, what is he doing? You know, but actually he's doing his, he's following his voice of, of dancing and praising God in, in the way that he knows how. And he's very um, thrilled about that. And, and he has all these experiences with uh, all the different characters in Auden's poem mm -hmm. about that. So it's uh, a lot of fun. And, and he just, he kind of has his own story, his own ballad that he's telling as he goes through all of his adventures. Cool, awesome. Thanks so much, Juliana. Oh, you're welcome. Um, all right. Next up is Corey Brodak um, and his poor, uh, his piece, uh, Autolalia for solo horn. Corey, you want to tell us about it? Sure. So um, this piece sort of spawned out of a great relationship I have with Andrew Palatier, who the work is written for. Um, he was my horn teacher when I was doing my master's studies at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. And when I first sat down to start taking lessons with him, he said, oh, you're a composer, send me your music. So I did uh, very nervously, maybe quite anxious to do so, because I didn't know why he asked me that. Um, and then he, wrote, he asked me to write a horn octet for our horn choir. And after that, he really enjoyed that piece quite a bit. And he wanted me to write him a solo work, which he later premiered at the International Horn Symposium uh, the year after, actually, just because of all the things that have happened in the last couple of years. Um, and it was quite nerve wracking for me as 
someone who enjoys playing horn but isn't necessarily looking to make it a profession um, to write a piece, a solo work for not only my teacher but also this amazing horn player. Um, he plays with the uh, Detroit Opera a little bit. Um, so when I sat down, I had no idea what to do. So I just picked up my horn and I started playing. And there were several improvisations that sort of just came out. Uh, and I just started writing them down. And eventually they became this set of seven different soliloquies. Uh, I had this sort of like narrative idea of this solo player on the stage that everyone's looking at, because it's, it's quite a nerve wracking thing to be standing on stage by yourself while everyone's looking at you. And the idea of having a soliloquy where they're talking to themselves, but also to the audience at the same time was quite interesting to me. Um, so, I, and I think uh, Patrick did a, a very good job with that as well, uh, sort of having this centered performer in the screen for the video performance. Um, awesome. So yeah, uh, what was my question? Oh, what was, I don't know, you might have already answered it, but what was the biggest challenge for you with this work? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I think the biggest challenge is writing for my teacher, but <laughs> also, um, I think I'm a composer who tends to benefit from a couple more voices. Uh, so in the last couple of years, um, just because of COVID and everyone being isolated, it's sort of of course, a lot of us to focus on writing for single instruments or just a couple instruments, which I think was really good for me because um, I've written quite a few works now. And I think I'm versatile between both types of ensembles, but it really makes you think about focusing on what the performer wants and what they're interested in playing. Um, and I think I achieved that. I think that might be a little bit egotistical to say, but I'm also a horn player, so I enjoyed playing it as much as I did uh, writing it. Mm -hmm. um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Like, that's a thing about solos, both on the performing side and on the composing side. It's just, it's the one thing. So the one thing, like, has to be everything and it has to do everything. And that's kind of, it, like, can be over a little bit overwhelming and intimidating <laughs> for either either performer or composer. Um, and then my last comment. So we made this work a little bit shorter. It's originally seven movements and we did three. Um, and we tend to, um, in this series, prefer shorter works. Um, so I was just curious, uh, did it work for you? <laughs> we didn't butcher it. Absolutely, yeah. I think that having that flexibility of not only having the seven movements, but having them be rearranged in whichever order the performer wants, uh, lends itself to sort of chopping off bits at the end as well. Um, and because of this performance, actually, I just wrote a saxophone duet uh, with a consortium of people that, all, that allows for the performance to do this. So there's five movements in that work, but they can sort of piece it together like they would if, if you're playing a set of pieces or a set of etudes at a recital or something like that. Cool. All right. Thanks so much, Corey. Thanks. Uh, all right. Uh, now we have Richard. He's going to talk about his piece, uh, Fantasy, for solo piano. Okay. Then I had two pieces on the programs. You just want to talk about the fantasy right now. Okay. Fantasy is for solo piano. Uh, it's fairly recent. It was written in January of uh, 2021, just a little over a year ago. I wanted to write something that was more, uh, well, was less rigid in terms of pre-compositional preparation. I wanted it to sound almost spontaneous, uh, as if it were being improvised, maybe. Uh, hence the title, Fantasy. So one of the things I did was to use some free notation, which I don't often do, but with a solo performer, you, you have some more freedom to, to approximate something. So I'm talking about feathered beams to show speeding up or slowing down. I detach stems from note heads to show that the rhythms might be approximate, uh, put the number of approximate number of seconds over, uh, over a section. Um, there's an example. So 
I suppose that would be the challenge for me in this in this piece is making that practical as well as getting the music notation to, to do it. Um, it. In terms of the content, pitch content, I used, I went through all of the different three note chords and associated a different kind of expression with each one. Mostly it's quiet, uh, peaceful, or ruminative, sometimes angry. <laughs> A different variety of expression in the piece, as if it, again, as as if it's being improvised on the spot. Um, yeah, I was kind of curious on that. On it, uh, there was there's a lot of juxtapositions of like suddenly very fast and then very slow, which um, was written in the in the score. I think it was less obvious, in at least in the way Minato uh, performed it. Um, um, and I'm just kind of wondering, was that was that just part like has to do with the characters or like um, what was there a compositional reason for the juxtaposition? Well, the, the different characters, but again, also the, the feeling of spontaneity, the feeling that, oh, I, I have this thought now. <laughs> now I'm going to play this. You know, it's just the kind of piece it is. It sounds less rigorous, more like it's just occurring to the performer at the, at the moment. Of course, it isn't. <laughs> No, it isn't. Yeah, no, yeah. I thought Minato did a great job with the the feel of the piece. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Richard. We'll be back in just a second. <laughs> We're going to talk to Sam about his piece. Um, it comes in waves. Yeah. Hi. Um, so, would you like me to just kind of give an overview of its history and a few things about its form, or? whatever. So um, I wrote it for my friend Gloria Yehalevsky, who uh, is a vibraphonist, and she commissioned it as part of a recital mm -hmm. that she already had a sort of sense of the structure she wanted all the pieces to have. Some of them were pre-existing pieces, and there was a, another commission on there as well. So I was fitting into that overall form, which was related to a wave form. Uh, so I had an idea of the uh, position within that structure and then I also kind of had my own structure as like a microcosm of that larger structure as like a series of little waves um, and a unique sort of uh, procedural thing about this piece that I'm also doing in some other pieces that are sort of loosely in a series is making a solo piece with electronics and building the electronics entirely out of samples of that performer playing their instrument um, which I really like doing sound design um, and sort of like sonic alchemy, taking something and totally transforming it. Uh, so, and it's also a great way for me to learn what types of sounds the uh, performer likes to make, uh, which like has come up quite a few times. And it's really great to have that one-on-one -on -one close relationship and learn about what all the instrument can do. So she sent me like an incredible amount of samples that we sort of talked in advance about what she was going to record and something she improvised. Um, some of it was like pitch material, like chords that I'd written in advance that she then sampled playing a few different ways that I knew I was going to use in the piece. Um, and so then I had a good amount of time to just go through those and create playable MIDI instruments from them, uh, just create like textures from them and all these sorts of things. So a lot of fun to take like a vibraphone, like hitting the damper or something and then transform it into a really boomy kick drum um, or something like like that. Uh, so uh, so that's where the electronics came from. And then I tend to uh, use like per, what I would maybe describe as kind of arcane, like very rigorous structural devices in my pieces, which are often sort of at odds with some of the sound world. It's drawn more from like popular music and has like, it has like a beat in it and a lot of like sort of ambient synth sounds and things. Um, so I devised a lot of rules to write this, a lot of which I don't really remember, but I often sort of come up with rules on a piece by piece basis that are sort of designed to create an overall effect. So with this wave thing in mind, I came up with like a series of crests uh, that basically the, there's this chord progression of five just diatonic chords that repeat a bunch in the track, um, but according to pretty, pre very rigorously predetermined cycles, the harp, like how long each chord lasts is constantly changing. So sometimes like a beat is cut off with a certain pattern and there's another pattern that runs on top of it that adds a beat to some measures. And so this was designed to create the sense of like each section sort of gradually speeding up and they're all 
uh, they eventually sort of hit these crests where this unrelated material that's not part of the chord progression that are these much more dissonant chords interrupt each wave. And then finally it arrives um, at like a metric modulation it's been pushing towards the whole time um, where the quintuplet takes over and becomes a quarter. And then the chords start running backwards over this kind of more exuberant final section. So it's sort of like this thing that's trying to push into this new rhythm um, and the chords are sort of repeating and stuck in these cycles and then they finally break through that. Um, and the vibraphone solo part gets a little bit more um, exuberant and like improvisatory sounding at that point. But uh, so yeah, I think that's sort of my overview of what it is and what it's about. Um, so I can um shoot um what oh i was a little bit curious about the video did you guys do that like after the first performance of it yeah it was it was like pretty soon after the the premiere uh performance which was in 2019. Mm -hmm. so cool. yeah yeah and she did a really great job with that it's really been uh it's really been awesome to work with her on this yeah i um the other thing I was gonna ask, actually, I was gonna, oh yeah, it kind of reminds me a little bit. I've done a lot of study personally on Harrison Burtwistle mm -hmm. and he does a he does things that sounds a lot like your process where he uses like an insanely rigorous algorithm to get something that sounds completely random. Like, yeah. And then later he doesn't even care if you if you mess up and the algorithm doesn't isn't there, it doesn't matter because it's just creating the effect. That yep. sounds yeah. yeah. I find it, and I mean, I think a lot of times for composing is sort of like a sort of therapeutic thing. There's something therapeutic for me of like free, like being really like concerned with all these details and figuring out the system and then being done and just being like, okay, fine. And that's even part of like the final stage of the piece where oftentimes like this process that's come up a, a few times of like a composer being like, hey, I mean, the performer saying this isn't so idiomatic, like maybe if we transpose this, I will very readily accept those things if they violate my system. Um, right, exactly. So it's yeah. just kind of like a way of getting the overall arc that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And then things can be moved around within that. And that feels sort of freeing and it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah I made this whole thing and now I could just whatever, move stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, that is, oh, what was the biggest challenge for you in writing this piece? Okay. Yeah, so I've, th I've been thinking about that. There's a there's a couple, I think the, really the biggest one is with solo pieces in general. And I'm writing a lot of th these right now. Um, pretty much all of my music is an instrument with electronics. There's a few others that have the same procedure. There's some where the electronics aren't from the samples. Um, but uh, I think the my sort of instinctive thinking, and it th relates to a lot of this sort of formulaic sort of writing, tends to favor like, um, very polyphonic textures with equal voices. You know, I'm very drawn towards like Renaissance polyphony and making canons and w whatever, uh, these sorts of things. And so having something that's very stratified where there's like a real hierarchy of different roles where like the soloist and the track are in these very stratified roles. Um, and the soloist has this very, is not an equal player in a polyphonic texture. It needs to be like driving the drama is, uh, I enjoy that challenge, but it's not instinctive for me. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I was going to say, I felt like what you were saying about it being stratified, I felt in your piece, at least in this particular one, that the it was really hard to tell to me where the live ended and the recording began, which I thought was really cool and, and really neat. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's part of me consciously resisting that stratification. <laughs> particularly using the samples that are that performer playing their instrument. Um, you know, I would have sort of like some things that were so processed that they were very clearly not a vibraphone, but other things that were like really in between and it was kind of hard to tell which is which. Um, yeah. So I'm really glad that came across. Great. So thanks so much, Sam. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, we're going to return to Richard <laughs> um, to talk about his other piece, uh, Valedictory for Solo Clarinet. Yeah, so Valedictory was written uh, quite some time ago, late 2005, uh, in honor of my mother, who had had a very severe stroke and was very ill, and in fact did pass away a few weeks later. So this is my farewell to my mother. One of the ways I express that is that there are uh, specific 
pulses, so slow pulse in the piece. It's that it's actually every third beat is sounded. So it might not be obvious to the listener, but every third beat has an attack on it. There are 84 of those because my mother was 84 years old at the time. But it reflects that in the, in the music. <clears throat> in terms of the pitches, which musical interval, the distance between two notes is typically associated with feelings of anxiety or, or uh, instability. It's the tritone, da da. So every, through almost all of the piece, every other interval is the tritone. So that, that makes for a very sad effect, instability. So it's a, an emotional piece. Yeah. Um, I was a little curious about, there's a lot of um, like echoes and like re repetitions. Um, was there, if I don't know, was there, uh, what purpose did they have? Well, I, I think it's just an expressive. Right. You have a thought and then you stop and then you look back on it. Usually the echoes are quieter. It's it's part of the the sadness in the piece. Yeah, yeah, that really came across. I liked I liked that aspect of it. Um, and uh, I maybe you already answered this, but what was the most challenging part of doing this work? You know, I don't think I remember. It was so long ago. <laughs> It was performed uh, uh, shortly after I wrote it, so it was it was difficult to to hear it <laughs> being performed. Yeah, experience. I can understand that. Hmm. Um, let's see. Um, I guess I don't have any other questions about it, but thank you for sharing like a very personal work. It was very beautiful. Thank you for playing it. Thank you, Richard. Um, all right. Next is Anthony Lai. Um, hey, hey. Hi. Who's, yeah, I got to perform this piece as well. So Anthony, tell us about it. Um, so it's only a song on the wind. Uh, it was kind of driven by the title. Uh, I'm a singer songwriter as well as a composer. And I, I tend to find songwriting to come a little bit easier because I have this self-imposed pressure when writing sort of classical stuff that it's supposed to be something profound or push the genre forward or push the instrument forward. And that tends to paralyze the writing more than help it. So I had this idea of, of coming up with a title that is dismissive of all of that. It's only a song on the wind. Uh, which actually freed me to to just start writing instead of worrying if it's going to be anything profoundly original or anything like that. And then the imagery of Song on the Wind really started to lend itself to how I constructed the piece, which starts very um, uh, gestural and there's uh, changing ideas fairly rapidly. And then as the piece goes on, ideas start to become motives and eventually it becomes a melody uh, as though you finally grabbed something out of the wind and got a song out of it, and then it goes back into uh, more fragmented. So it's, I don't know, um, the, the title was really, I usually, when I'm writing an abstract sort of uh, absolute music, I come up with the title after I've written it. But in this case, the title really helped uh, create a sort of um, ethereal imagery. So that's the idea behind that. Cool. Uh, what was the most challenging part of writing it? Uh, I am by nature a very harmony driven composer and a very uh, timbre change, uh, like orchestration is a big thing for me. So, I mean, even in my songwriting, you're going to hear one instrument get taken over by another one uh, very often. So the attention span for one timbre for me is always a challenge. Um, so that's, yeah, with solo works, how do I keep my own interest with, with a single instrument is, is the challenge for me there. Yeah. 
Interesting. Um, is that part of the reason that you decided to uh, do the delay and the reverb on it? Uh, that was to really help with the, the wind. I, I knew I wanted space, hmm. but I didn't want space in the form of silence. And, and delay really helps where it's still happening, but it's not happening kind of a thing, um, which also helped. Um, part of the challenge that was enjoyable was I knew every gesture was going to be repeated at least prominently twice immediately after it happened. So it had to be interesting enough of a gesture to want to hear it two more times, you know. Um, but no, the delay was it was really uh, sort of from the beginning. I mm. wanted uh, th that kind of spacey feel to the piece. Um, and then I actually had another question, which was, have you had it performed live? No, it was a studio recording that I sent you and, and I'm really curious how it will go over live. That, um, yeah, that's my question. I was like, I'm curious how the, um, how the, how it'll work, you know, like with the effects and everything in a live environment. So maybe, yeah, and the, maybe one day we'll get to find out. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. Cause I know to, to really get the effect I want, there would have to be two speakers very widely placed in the house so that the echoes are very distant and, and spatial and stuff. So it'd be great to hear that. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, it was, um, I think just uh, the things that you said about it after having played it, like the, the alto flute, like has a lot of timbral possibilities, a mm. lot of colors, um, that it can do. So I can see like with some of the things you said, I was like, Oh, that's, that makes sense with, the, with the decisions and the piece that you made. So, yeah. And, and the, the, there's a windiness to the alto flute, right? Yeah. It's breathier than the other. And so that was, you know, the nature of the transposition, you could just look at it and play it on regular flute, but it just, it's not the same. Flute's too focused, right? Alto flute's got yeah. that. that yeah. Thing. That extra, I think it's, I don't know if it's overtones. Like, yeah. That extra sort of fuzz to it. Breathy yeah. fuzz. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So great. Thanks, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, we just have one more composer um, and we're back to Robert Kendall. So <laughs> almost circling all the way back to the beginning. And he's going to tell us about his elegy for the victims of COVID-19. Hello again. So this was a piece written as a response to this horrible tragedy that has befallen us. Um, there's um, the, the death toll in this country alone for COVID has is around a million people now, which is uh, almost as many people who have, all, almost as many Americans who have died in all the wars that the United States has fought throughout its history. So it's just sort of mind boggling. So I just felt that I had to respond musically to this somehow. So the piece is an expression of, um, of sorrow, but also an expression of anger because so much of the uh, toll that this pandemic has taken on us is, is unnecessary. It's the result of mismanagement and political profiteering and so on. So, so the piece is, is basically, uh, it's for solo violin. It's basically a, um, a sad, slow lament, but then it's interrupted periodically with these fortissimo outbursts that are meant to um, just express rage at this condition. And then there's a, a middle section that um, becomes more agitated and the rage just sort of boils over. And then it just gradually fades out into sort of resigned despair toward the end. Um, and it's also, um, it's also expressing loneliness because here's the poor violin socially distancing, it's all by itself. And, um, you know, musicians have had to socially distance. A lot of them are playing solo works. They're, you know, starting YouTube channels where they just play solo pieces every week. And so, so um, this is expressed too, the, the loneliness of this situation that, that's, that we're all in now. And um, there's a lot of double stops in this one, even more so than in the other piece. It's, 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 um, fairly contrapuntal in a lot of places. And uh, whenever you whenever you play harmony on the violin, uh, there's always the sense that it's sort of pushing at the boundaries. You know, it's essentially a, a melody instrument that can 
play two strings at once under certain conditions, but uh, not under other conditions. And th there's always, uh, it's never quite like listening to two violins playing counterpoint. There's always, uh, you know, you have to drop the notes early and, and, and that sort of thing. So there's always a little bit of a sense of uh, uh, struggle in, in a way when, when you write counterpoint for the violin. So, so there's a bit of that there, the, the, the sense that it's, it's pushing against its loneliness. So, so that's where the piece um, comes from emotionally and artistically. And um, as with the other piece, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is um, well, like some of the other composers here, I, I focus on counterpoint and, and harmony I've written seven string quartets and uh, focus on, I've written a lot of uh, canons and fugues and that sort of thing. So it's, it's difficult to, um, to sometimes um, refocus on a single melodic line. So I focused a lot on the double stops and uh, I use MIDI when I compose. And of course the computer can play double stops flawlessly. It, it sounds quite different than when you play them on an actual instrument. So, so the challenge was um, writing these contrapuntal sections and really gauging how they're going to sound on the violin and you know what's going to work and, and what isn't. And um, I had some wonderful contrapuntal passages that I basically had to sacrifice because I knew they'd just be unplayable. So, you know, I ended up just substituting uh, an open string drone for this nice imitative passage or, or something like that. So, um, so that was really the, the main challenge. Cool. Um, yeah, Anthony really liked uh, your comment, pushing against its loneliness. I, yeah, it's great way to put it. Um, and also this just reminded me, you, when, as soon as you said social distancing, uh, Richard wrote a piece called social distancing and Dorothea did it on our, well, the last series that we did last year. So it's just like kind of a weird, uh, confluence of ideas. Yeah. Um, uh, I think you answered all my questions about it. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much, Robert. I, uh, want to take a minute and just make some pluggables, uh, some plugs for our upcoming stuff. Um, I'll put them in the chat and I will also as well as saying them. So we are next composer salon where composers can share works either in progress or that they are have completed. Um, many of you here have already participated, but our next composer salon is April 20th at 6 p.m. Um, Eastern time. Um, it's free to come observe and chat and meet other composers. Um, uh, it does cost if you want to present. Um, uh, then our next event, we have a whole bunch of events coming up. So um, our next event is the Composer Interview Series. Um, and that's going to be with Malika Fitzhugh, who we talked to a little bit earlier. We're going to talk to her more about her music and her how her music intersects between the old and the new, as you might have guessed from her choice of um, writing uh, for the re recorder. So that's on May 4th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And then she is also doing, Mel is doing a um, workshop uh, along with Francis Bleeker, who's a well-known recorder player on May 14th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. They're gonna do a workshop on writing for recorder, but in contemporary music. Um, and all of those, you can uh, get more details, sign up at bostonnewmusic.org slash tickets. And then finally, our big plug, um, uh, we will be returning to live music. We're hosting the Living Music Summit June 3rd through 5th. There's gonna be three, um, three concerts, uh, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. If you're in the Boston area, please come check us out. If you are not, everything is also going to be live streamed so you can check out our concerts. Um, if you're in the Boston area, there's also, we're going to be doing um, a workshop on writing for percussion. Uh, we're also going to be doing, um, uh, yes, another workshop, um, a follow-up workshop, uh, for reading pieces for a recorder. Uh, so the writing you can learn about it on May 14th. And then if you have a piece by June, 
um, or a snippet that you want read, we're going to have a reading. And uh, we'll also do some social events. So if you're in the Boston area, um, keep in touch, check out what we have. We're going to do some, some different meetups with composers. Um, so that's all of our upcoming events. We have a lot going on. And I want to say thank you so much to all of my, all of you wonderful composers and performers that came and chatted with us today. Thank you so much for sharing your process and your time with us. Um, and thank you to any and all of you out there that watch this. And that's it. I hope everyone has a wonderful Sunday. Thank you, Beth. Thank, thank you. you. This is great.